Welcome back to another week in motivation. So this week we're going to be talking about implicit motives. So implicit motives are these enduring non-conscious needs that influence how a person thinks, feels, and behaves. So non-conscious means we can't self-report on it. It's non-conscious, right? As explicit motives, on the other hand, um, are conscious, readily available, and verbally stated motivations. Um, so McClelland is a researcher who really pioneered research on implicit motives. And this whole research area started because he noticed that there was a discrepancy between what people would say and what they would actually do. So for example, I say that I'm gonna get up early on my Saturday morning, clean the house, go to the farmer's market, uh, go for a run, all of this great stuff. But in reality, I turn my alarm clock off, roll over and go back to sleep. My words and my actions don't always match up. And so what McClellan suggests was that this was a disconnect between our implicit motives and our explicit motives. And he suggests that our implicit motives do a better job of predicting behavior because they're not going to be biased by this like social desirability, right? By what we say we're gonna do. Um, so when we talk about assessing explicit and implicit motives, we have to do it in very different ways. Explicit motives, we can ask, right? They're conscious. We can ask, what are you motivated to do? Implicit motives, we can't ask about. We have to wait and observe your own behavior. So, ex so explicit motives, we can ask people to self-report. Implicit motives, because they're non-conscious, we have to look at people's behavior and kind of infer. For implicit motives, um, the, there are three most commonly studied implicit motives of achievement, affiliation, and power. These are the three implicit motives we're going to focus on in this lecture series. There are other implicit motives, such as need for cognition, need for closure, um, but we just unfortunately don't have the time to go over all of them. So we're going to stick with, with these three. So implicit motives, let's talk more about implicit motives as a broad over, overarching construct. Implicit motives are acquired needs. What this means is no one is born with a need for achievement. Right? We don't born waking up and be like, oh, I need to go achieve a lot in my life. Instead, our personal experience, our socialization, and our developmental history teaches us to expect positive emotions from certain types of situations. And it is this anticipation of a positive emotion which leads us to organize our lives around these activities. So if I, for example, begin to learn that um, if I engage in a need for achievement behavior, um, I'm likely to feel really positive about it. I'm likely to feel good. And so over time, I start to learn that these types of situations that allow me to have high need for achievement and to really strive against a standard of excellence are likely to make me feel really positive. So I'm going to start to prefer those kinds of situations. I'm going to develop an acquired preference that is associated with my acquired implicit motive. So this is very different from underlying psychological needs. So I wanna take a second and just really dig into this. How are our implicit motives different from autonomy, competence, and relatedness? They may sound similar when we talk about competence and achievements or affiliation and relatedness, but they are different. So these Basic psychological needs are universal. Everybody wants to feel autonomous, competent, and related. Everybody wants that in their lives. Implicit motives, on the other hand, are learned. You may be high need for achievement. I may not be, right? It is learned based on our own personal history and personal experience. So psychological needs are universal implicit motives are acquired. So how do we get implicit motives? How are they acquired? Implicit motives are learned through engaging in the world starting at a very young age in infancy and childhood. 
So experience, once again, teaches us to, ex to, to expect positive emotions in response to some situations compared to others, right? So for example, if uh, positive emotions tend to occur and pursue some kind of standard of excellence, right? I'm up against some standard and I feel so positive when I'm up against that standard, it leads to preferences where there's a very clear standard of excellence, where there's a very clear win-loss situation, and it leads to a very high achievement motivation. When, it's, when an incentive is associated with a particular need, um, for example, a date, like a romantic date is uh, associated with an affiliation incentive, a person high in that need experiences emotional and behavioral activation. They feel hopeful. They're excited about it. They're looking forward to it, right? So we see, once again, that preference for these situations where we expect positive emotions based on our implicit motives. So McClellan, again, the kind of pioneering researcher in implicit motives, McClellan and Pylon did a study in 1983, and they're looking at how people acquire these social needs. And so they looked at um, the amazing longitudinal study, and they scored parental practices of five-year-old kids, and then looked at their implicit motives 26 years, years later, when they were 31 years old, 26 years later, holy moly. What they find is that parents who imposed high standards on their children uh, raised kids who turned into adults with a high need for achievement. Parents who used praise as a socialization technique for their children had kids that turned into high need for affiliation adults. And then parents who were permissive about sex and aggression tended to have children who turned into adults with a very high need for power. So what we're seeing is that even at five years old, these early socialization techniques, these uh, early uh, histories, personal experiences that we have, ha can have an impact on our implicit motives 26 years later. So these implicit motives are learned and they're learned over a very long period of time. It starts very, very young. We also do know that these implicit motives can change over time. Um, so for example, being in a high achievement oriented occupation can lead for a higher need for achievement than being in a non-achievement oriented occupation. So if you take the same people and you put them in a entrepreneurship occupation, which is very high need for achievement, they're going to have a higher need for need for achievement motivation than if you put someone in a non-achievement or non-achievement oriented occupation such as teaching. Teachers typically have um, less need for achievement motive. The big takeaway from this is that implicit motives develop during childhood, but they also continue to change across our entire lifespan based on the experiences we engage in. So how do our implicit motives actually motivate our behavior? So implicit motives are activated by a specific class of social interaction, social incentives, right? So we find ourselves in certain situations um, and these situations lead to lots of positive emotions. We have an emotion-based preference for those situations, right? We like to do things that make us feel good. And so being in a high affiliation situation leads us to feel good. We're going to seek out more and more high affiliation situations. Eventually, the situation and the positive emotion go hand in hand. So we start to feel positive in the face of those situations. If going against a standard of excellence leads to me feel really positive, over time as learning occurs, just being in a standard of excellence situation is going to allow me to feel really positive. So we see this learning over time. And for achievement, affiliation, and power, we see that there are different situations that kind of activate these motives. So achievement, doing something well to show competence can be achievement satisfying. And then an opportunity to please others and gain approval, being involved in these warm, secure relationships can develop an affiliation motive. And then having an impact on others, having an impact on those around us 
can develop a power motivation. So how can our implicit motives motivate behavior? Implicit motives are reactive. So they are activated when we encounter a potentially need-satisfying incentive that activates a particular pattern of emotions. So who here likes public speaking? Most people don't, but those of you who do really enjoy public speaking, I'm going to guess you're probably kind of high on a need for power, a need to have an impact on those around us. And you've learned over time that this need satisfying situation like public speaking is an opportunity to satisfy that power motive and it's positive emotions and it's exciting and it's fun. So you have all these positive emotions wrapped up around us. People who are lower on need for power probably do not have those same positive emotions. So implicit motives are also anticipated. So we learn that certain situations give us an opportunity to satisfy certain needs. So we can anticipate feeling positive when we enter certain situations. And satisfying implicit motives bring out positive emotions and they can help us answer the question, what makes us happy? What about our implicit motives makes us happy and allows us to really generate some good positive emotions? So next up, we're going to talk about the specific implicit motives and ways we can kind of satisfy our implicit motives. And specifically, we're going to look at achievement motivation up next. So see you guys in a bit.